Well, brethren, once again, the Lord has been good to us, giving us a night of rest and bringing us together in safety. And let's seek his face together for his blessing upon our time this morning. We thank you, our Father, that the way of access is open to you, having been secured by the once-for-all sacrifice of your beloved Son, and now his continuous advocacy and intercession at your right hand. And therefore, we approach you as you encourage us to do, for you have said, having therefore a great high priest over the house of God, Let us draw near with boldness. So we come in his name, trusting only in the virtue of that perfect life, that life of obedience, obedience even to the death of the cross. And we thank you, you have validated the worth of that sacrifice by raising him from the dead, seating him at your own right hand, And therefore we come in Jesus' name, trusting in him, and that through him you will receive our persons and our petitions. And we come asking that this hour we may know the presence and help of our risen Lord mediated to us by the Spirit. Come, we pray, and help us, help me as I seek to instruct Help my brethren as they seek to listen with a discerning ear that when this hour is concluded, our hearts may be lifted up in thanksgiving that once again you have come to us in our need. Hear us then, we plead. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, for reasons that I gave you in the previous lecture, we're going to be working with an approach to sermon construction, which regards the constituent elements consisting of an introduction or the exordium, the discussion or argument, the body of the sermon, and then the conclusion, or as it is described in classic rhetorical literature, the peroration. In the previous lecture, we addressed the subject of the introduction, its function, guidelines for its construction, sources for suitable introductions, and I concluded with some miscellaneous exhortations and warnings pertaining to the construction of suitable introductions. In this lecture, we move on to begin our treatment of the major part of each sermon, namely, what is called the discussion or the argument of the sermon. And since so many of the principles will vary in relationship to the kind of sermon preached, that is, a topical expository, textual expository, or consecutive expository sermon, I've chosen to lay out the material relative to the discussion part of our sermons in terms of a specific and distinct set of guidelines for each kind of sermon. I don't believe it would be responsible or even possible to simply give generic directives that apply equally or even in any measure to each of those three kinds of sermons. So, in taking up this subject, I'm assuming the recognition and implementation of axiom number three of the seven axioms which apply to all preaching, namely, that the sermon will be marked by perspicuity or clarity of form and of structure. And nowhere is this axiom of greater importance than in the body or the discussion segment of our sermons. In this lecture this morning, we will concentrate all of our attention on giving guidelines for the construction of the discussion or argument of a topical expository sermon or a series of such sermons. The basic outline that we will follow in this lecture will be used as well in dealing with the discussion or argument of each kind of sermon And I have but three main headings. The goals envisioned. Secondly, 
the disciplines essential to the attainment of those goals, and thirdly, some concluding guidelines and counsels. First of all, then, the goals envisioned in the discussion or argument of a topical expository sermon. Now, while assuming that the salvation and edification of your people are always your great and overarching concerns, what are the specific and distinguishing goals of the individual topical expository sermon or series of such sermons? Goals that we should consciously have before us when preparing a topical expository sermon. If you're aiming at nothing, you'll most likely attain it without much effort. And so it's vital. We've come to our desk. Through a number of factors, we're persuaded that we ought to prepare and preach a topical sermon on this or that biblical theme, or upon this or that general subject that has emerged in the life of the congregation, in the life of the nation, etc., all of the things that we spoke about yesterday that might be the proper triggers to prepare and preach a topical expository sermon. You've come to your desk. You're going to start your preparation. What goals should be before you? so that when you leave your study and you leave your notes or your manuscript on the desk, you have some sense what I have prayerfully and thoughtfully prepared with the blessing of God when I preach it will attain these goals. What are the goals then of a topical expository sermon? I would like to suggest that there ought to be at least three distinct goals before you from the very beginning of your preparation. Number one, the presentation of an accurate and balanced view of your subject or your biblical theme. Now, I've used the two ordinary common words, accurate and balanced. What's the opposite of accurate? Put the little prefix, inaccurate or worse yet, erroneous. You were concerned to present a view of your subject that no fair-minded person who knows his Bible could say was either inaccurate or erroneous. But it must also be balanced, a presentation that is not imbalanced, a presentation that is not distorted, which presents not the biblical view of your subject, but a caricature of the biblical view. The face of truth is always beautiful. And a beautiful face is a face in which the individual features are all in proper proportion in themselves and in relationship to the whole. You might have a woman with a lovely forehead and lovely ears and a well-shaped mouth, but if she's got a hooked nose, no one says, that's a beautiful woman. They'd say, if only she'd get that nose fixed, she'd be beautiful. Well, we want a topical sermon in which the nose is not halfway to being a Pinocchio nose, and the ears halfway to being Dumbo ears, or the mouth look like a lion's mouth. We want sermons that in that sense are a beautiful presentation of that truth in which each of the features is solidly biblical and all together in proper proportion. So this should be one of our dominant goals, the presentation of an accurate and balanced view of the subject or biblical theme that I'm going to treat. Now in the case where your subject is not drawn from the scriptures, you must still aim at being accurate and balanced in your treatment of it. In the case where you're taking up an explicitly biblical subject, such as, for example, intercessory prayer, or Christian joy, or the doctrine of hell, you must have as your goal an accurate and balanced presentation of the facets of these truths 
that you are seeking to expound and apply to the conscience of your hearers. This does not mean, and I want to underscore this, that you must attempt or claim to be exhaustive or fully comprehensive in the treatment of your theme. By the use of a few qualifying sentences, you can make your hearers aware of the much larger setting or the inseparable attendance of these aspects that you are treating. For example, suppose you discerned, and if you have fellow elders, they concurred, that there was a need to preach several topical sermons on the subject of Christian joy. You could make it plain at the outset that you are not seeking to set forth primarily a formal, intricate definition of Christian joy, the unique source of joy, but you are primarily addressing the duty of maintaining joy in the midst of affliction. You have narrowed your field and you said, this is what I'm addressing. I'm conscious. There are many other major aspects of this that I'm not addressing so that in presenting that individual focus, you may nonetheless have an accurate and balanced presentation, though you are not claiming or attempting to be exhaustive or fully comprehensive. Suppose you were preaching on the doctrine of hell and you were particularly concerned that the everlastingness of hell coming under such attack as it is, is a matter of the doctrine that needed to be preached. Well, you could say at the very outset, any thorough treatment of the biblical doctrine of hell would have to address what is there in the character of God that demands the doctrine of hell. I am not going to address that. Perhaps at a future time I will, but because of the attacks upon the biblical truth on the unendingness of hell, I am going to focus all of our attention upon those texts which clearly teach that when men are cast into hell, they are cast into a state and condition of conscious, eternal, unending suffering and punishment. Now you see what you've done. You've acknowledged that there are many other facets to the doctrine. You're not touching them. You are focusing in upon that one aspect. Now I trust you can readily see why this first goal comprises both the great challenge and the real difficulty and dangers associated with topical expository preaching. As we affirmed yesterday, in a very real sense, such preaching is preaching systematic theology in one of its departments. Therefore, you must, if you're going to be an effective topical expository preacher, you must become an increasingly well-grounded and clear-thinking, systematic theologian. It is only in this way that as you treat one of the parts, your mind and heart are conditioned to keep that part in due proportion in relationship to the whole body of God's truth. To this end, brethren, I urge you, to be continually reading in the various areas of systematic theology that at the time you're reading have no direct reference to what you may be preaching. You are simply seeking to continually fill your mind and your heart with an ever-growing awareness of the total corpus of God's truth so that when you pick up one aspect of it, that growing awareness and understanding is constantly acting as a quality control pressure upon your thinking. Because God's truth is so interrelated that if we're wrong at one point, often we'll be wrong in many others. So goal number one is that when I'm done my preparation, I will have a good conscience that to the best of my present knowledge and understanding of the Word of God, I am going to set before my people an accurate and a balanced view of the subject or theme to be treated. 
The second major goal of the discussion of a topical expository sermon is that of seeking to demonstrate the true biblical basis for the view you are giving of your theme or your subject. In other words, you must not merely tack on verses in support of the affirmations that you make throughout the sermon. You must actually open up, expound the pivotal text relating to your subject or theme. It is for this reason that I insist on using the terminology topical expository preaching. It is topical in its form, but it is expository in its essential nature. And concerning this matter, the Puritan model is very helpful. For example, you know if you've read John Owen, the real John Owen. Thank God for a lot of the new condensations and reorientations, but to me, there's no substitute for taking down volume six with all of its previous markings and notes and all the rest and getting Owen undiluted, Owen un, uh, un whatever. All right. You know he begins his treatise on mortification by opening up in a detailed, compelling way, Romans 8 and verse 13. If you, by the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. And by detailed, compelling exposition that carries your judgment, you feel, I now know what Romans 8.13 is telling me. And then with that as the structural framework, he then gives us his topical sermons on the subject of mortification. A couple of months ago, as I was trying to get back into some of my old Puritan sets, I read Flavel, Volume 1, a masterful, masterful treatment on the person and work of Christ, starting with Christ's relationship to the Father, pre-incarnate condition in eternity, the communion between the Father and the Son, all the way to the consummation at the second coming. And along the way, he takes specific text, and he expounds them to set the framework of his topical discussion. Another great example from Flavel is his treatise on the Christian's great duty, based upon Proverbs 4.23. Guard your heart above all that you guard, for out of it are the issues of life. Solid, clear, compelling exposition of that text sets the framework and then he pours the rest of the Bible into it in a topical way. And so, brethren, if indeed you are convinced that a topical sermon must be one in which the true biblical basis for the view you are giving must be patent in your preaching, you come to your desk saying, before I leave, with any confidence that this is a Christ-exalting, God-pleasing sermon, there must be substantial exposition of text of Scripture that handled properly will persuade the people that my view of this issue is indeed God's view. But then there is a third goal, a major goal, and it is this. The topical expository sermon is a sermon. Therefore, we must have the goal of making practical applications of our theme or subject to the real world of our hearers. Remember, we are preaching a topical expository sermon. We are not merely teaching a topical lesson. And I've wrestled with this question over the years. What, if anything, is the essential difference between teaching and preaching? The Bible has words to make the distinction. Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching and preaching. Now, if all teaching is preaching and all preaching is teaching, why did the Holy Ghost choose two different words? And while I believe any proper understanding knows there's interpenetration and overlapping, if there is any fundamental difference or distinction between teaching and preaching, I believe it lies in what I would call the dominant focus 
of each form of communicating the Word of God. We are to preach the Word. We are to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded. But there is a dominant focus in teaching that is fundamentally different from the dominant focus in preaching. In teaching, the primary, not the exclusive, the primary focus is upon that of imparting information to the minds of our hearers. However, in preaching, not the exclusive, but the primary focus is upon conveying comfort, urging to action, reforming practice, etc. In other words, in teaching, the primary focus of our endeavors is the minds of our hearers. In preaching, the primary focus of our endeavors is the affections and the wills of our hearers. You're attacking the mind when you teach to the end that truth understood will affect the life, the affections, the will, the practice. But the primary focus is getting a block of truth found in the Bible, mediated through your mind and your tongue into the heads of your hearers. But in preaching, your primary focus is getting stuff out of the Bible, through your mind, through your tongue, that will touch the affections and the wills of your hearers. You see, though, there's overlapping because we're dealing with truth. In all true teaching, we must teach the Word. In all true preaching, there must be teaching. But the primary focus, I ask you to think about that. That's my present uh, perspective after many, many years of wrestling with that. And if it's valid, then this must be a conscious goal when you sit at your desk preparing that topical sermon. How can all of this be brought down with laser sharp focus upon the affections and the wills of our hearers, whether for comfort, whether for conviction, whether for motivation, the whole spectrum of the issues addressed by the Word of God. So those are the three primary goals in my judgment that we must have before us in a topical expository sermon. That brings us then, secondly, to the disciplines essential to attain these goals. You may prefer the word steps. I thought it was kind of vapid and colorless, so I put disciplines. Uh, it's got a little more vigor to it. So if, but if you feel more comfortable with steps and want to strike out disciplines and write in steps, I'll not be offended at all. Just don't ask me to change my word, all right? I like my word. The disciplines essential to attain these goals. In opening up this line of thought, and I'll do this with each of the lectures concerning the body or the argument of the sermon, we'll look at the initial disciplines, the intermediate disciplines, and the concluding disciplines. <clears throat> I think that's simple enough outline to remember. The, inter the initial disciplines, what are they? You've come to your desk. The goals are there before your mind. Now what do you actually do to pursue those goals? Well, number one, the first discipline must always be that of engaging in earnest prayer for the present aid of the Holy Spirit upon your labors. Now we always need the Spirit's grace and power as the spirit of illumination, pastoral insight, genuine pastoral concern in any kind of sermon preparation. However, we need especially the aid of the Spirit as the spirit of wisdom and counsel when working on the discussion of a topical sermon because of the peculiar dangers of imbalance, understatement, overstatement that are connected with a topical expository sermon. I addressed those things yesterday. The disadvantages, the potential dangers in topical expository preaching. And brethren, to avoid those dangers, we need in our initial disciplines to start with earnest pleading with God, especially James 1.5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, 
and it shall be given him. Lord, the spirit that rested upon your son, the spirit of wisdom, of counsel, and of might, Isaiah 11, may that spirit from my risen Lord descend down upon me at this desk. O oh Lord Jesus, give me of your Holy Spirit as the spirit of wisdom and of counsel. And then you ought to wear out Luke eleven thirteen 13 in your Bibles. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He gives lovingly, generously, but he gives to those who ask. And those who do not ask, God says in the language of James, you have not because you ask not. And there are times when we have limited and restricted measures of the Spirit's help in our sermon preparation, not because necessarily we have some gross unconfessed sin that is grieving the Spirit. We've just been too proud to humble ourselves and say, Oh, my Father, I must have your Spirit's help. And ask Him, because He says, You have not, because you ask not. Ask, and it shall be given you. And so, in the initial disciplines, first and foremost is that of engaging in earnest prayer for the present aid of the Holy Spirit upon our labors. The second initial discipline is that of seeking to acquire a broad acquaintance with your subject or your theme. Now, why is this step necessary? Well, I answer because of the first and fundamental goal of a topical expository sermon, namely to present an accurate and a balanced view of your subject. If a part of the subject is treated as though it were the whole, balance is not realized. How then are you to gain this broad acquaintance with your subject or theme? I answer by prayerfully, diligently using the tools at your disposal calculated to give you this broad acquaintance. And first among them, if you're dealing with a biblical theme, is an exhaustive concordance. I can remember when preparing the series that God continues to use, preached way back in the 60s, and I get a trickle of letters and emails and face-to-face -face comments, a series on the fear of God. And I can remember sitting at my desk with the first book I got after I was converted. Someone gave me the old Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, weighs about seven pounds. And I spread it out on my desk, and I looked up every single reference to the fear of God in my Bible. And by the time I was done, I said, man, if people aren't acquainted with the fear of God, they are strangers to biblical religion from Genesis to Revelation. You get the broad acquaintance by going to the Scriptures. And it doesn't mean you necessarily have to look up every reference. You see the little phrase, that's fear of God, that's fear of God, that's fear of the devil, that's fear of one's enemies, fear of God, fear of God, fear. And then you take a pencil and you put a little tick by every reference to the fear of God. And then when you're done, you start counting them up. And you say, man, this is a dominant biblical theme. And then you begin to see it's there in Genesis. It's there through the Pentateuch. It's there in the historical books. It's there in the prophets. It's there in the gospels. It's there in the epistles. It's there in Revelation. And then you say, now, how am I going to preach this to the people? Well, maybe it'd be good to start with the dominance of the fear of God in biblical religion. And then you take a key text out of Genesis and a key text out of the Pentateuch, some other place, key text out of the historical books, and you're using the biblical theological method and you're letting your people see that this concept is an organic, fundamental concept in the Bible. And when you persuaded them that it is indeed that, then you say, well, what in the world is it? And you're moving into another area. What are you doing? In this initial study, using your concordances, sometimes your catechisms, confessions of faith, your systematic theologies, 
printed and audio sermons of others who've handled your subject, you are seeking to acquire a broad acquaintance with your subject or with your theme. Sometimes I found it very helpful to do a speed reading from Romans through to the book of Jude, a speed reading of the epistles on a given subject. When teaching a series on uh, the training of children to do some several speed readings through the book of Proverbs, that kind of thing that is giving you a broad acquaintance with your subject. And then you want to see if others have treated that subject. And I can remember in addition to my concordance, I believe Bunyan's little work, paperback by the banner on the fear of God, had been printed. I'm not absolutely certain, but I do remember reading the section in Principles of Conduct by Professor Murray on the fear of God in that phrase, the fear of God is the soul of godliness. Wait a minute, what's a body without a soul? It's a corpse. It's ready for the undertaker. Religion without the fear of God is a corpse. No wonder that stuff got hold of me. And then I went to John Brown. I had the old green-covered books that were produced by J. Green, and one of the first ones was the three volumes of John Brown's Expositions of 1 Peter. And I went to the text, Fear God, Honor the King. Fear God. I think he had about 17 pages. And he took me after that broad exposure from concordances, getting fired up with Professor Murray. Then I came to John Brown, and he gave a definition of the fear of God that fit. I won't tell you what it is. I want you to go get John Brown and read him. But it gave that acquaintance that then when you begin to narrow down your reading, you say, that resonates with what I've read in my Bible, what I searched out in my concordances. So... That discipline in some subjects is going to take many hours, but it must be done if you're going to pursue the goal of presenting an accurate and balanced presentation of your theme or subject. Third, initial discipline is you should note and record the main texts and major strands of your theme. As you read on the subject and are seeking to uh, get a grasp on it, you'll find various authors using certain texts as proof texts for the subject that you are investigating. Ordinarily, such texts are used with recurring frequency because they do indeed bear the weight that is placed upon them. For example, if you were teaching and preaching on the general theme of the absolute sovereignty of God, you would find in reading in your systematic theologies, reading sermons on that subject, taking Pink's book, The Sovereignty of God, that certain texts came up again and again. Daniel 4.35, the words of Nebuchadnezzar, that this God has his way in heaven, among the armies of heaven and earth, and none can stay his hand and say unto him, what are you doing? Ephesians 1.11, the God who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Romans 11.36, of him, through him, unto him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. Some of the Psalms, Jehovah reigns, simple affirmations of the absolute sovereignty of God. And you begin to note that certain texts are used by different authors. And you say, those are going to be my champions. They're going to be my front rank soldiers when I line up my army to go out after the minds and the hearts of my people. If you were bringing a topical expository message on the subject of human depravity, you would find again and again such texts as Genesis 6, 5. The thoughts of the imaginations of the heart, only evil continually. You'll always find Psalm 51, 6. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother 
conceive me. Romans 3, 10 to 21. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. And Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. You hath he made alive who were dead. Well, when you find those texts coming out in different authors, you say, all right, I don't need to try to be novel. I don't need to find some text hidden away in the book of Zephaniah. These are the champions who have gone out and taken the field by other men. They're going to be my champions as well. I'm standing in that historic continuum. So in your initial disciplines, prayer, broad investigation, then begin to note and record the main text and major strands of your theme. Finally, in the initial disciplines, you should carefully exegete the key text which will form the basis of your proof, of your discussion, of your argument. Make sure upon careful investigation that your chosen text will bear the weight which you place upon them. Occasionally you'll find a text that has a traditional use that will not stand up under the scrutiny of careful exegesis. And here I want to mention one. You'll find the Puritans again and again using uh, Galatians 3, 24. The law is our schoolmaster to lead us unto Christ. And there they use the text to support the truth that ordinarily in the working of God in converting grace, he does a prior work of convincing us of our sinfulness by means of the law. That's a biblical truth taught many places. But Galatians 3.24 is not teaching us that. Galatians 3.24 is talking about redemptive history and the place of the law as a covenant through Moses in the history of redemption. So though you find a lot of the old Puritans using that, you say, no, I, I won't be able contextually to expound that text for that purpose. Now, having said that, I'm going to put a little sidebar. I get irritated with the smart Alex who find an occasional Puritan misuse of a text based often upon some of the limitations of the authorized version and then dismissing the Puritans as careless exegetes. That just plain gets me mad. Recently, in reading that volume one of, of Flavel on the glory of Christ, I made it a point to sit there in my devotions with Flavel morning after morning, determined to look up every single verse that he brought in to support. And I mean, he brought in verses from all over. I did not find one that was the misuse of a text. I was humbled that I've read my Bible through so many times and didn't have the working grasp upon those texts that if I were handling the subject Flavel was handling, I would never have thought of that obscure verse tucked away in the book of Judges and another one tucked away in the book of Haggai. But when I looked them up, the use of those verses was, was profound at some times. So that's just a little sidebar, lest any of you think that I'm denigrating the Puritans' handling of the Word of God. On this point of carefully exegeting the key text and making sure that contextual, careful, linguistic handling of the text, it will bear the weight you're putting upon it. Dabney has a most compelling comment, and I want to read him to you. The preacher should see to it that his proof is unanswerable. Nothing should be advanced which is not solid, and all should be so perspicuously, clearly, and forcibly put as to silence every mind which is not perverse. <laughs> in other words, he knows you occasionally you're going to have perverse people who say, well, I don't see that in the Bible. Well, that's your interpretation. But don't worry about perverse people. Be concerned that you will carry the judgment of people who love God and love his word. While every public speaker must be prompted to speak convincingly by whatever motive causes him to speak at all, this force is demanded of the preacher by a more solemn obligation. It is God's truth which he advocates. It is a system which he claims, which claims infallible certainty. Common hearers are apt to suspect that an inconclusive argument 
betrays an inconclusive proposition. For this, although not a just, is a most natural inference. The result of sophistical preaching, that's clever but unsound reasoning. He said the result of that kind of preaching is to make Christianity seem sophistical. It hangs together with specious reasoning. He is no small criminal who by his indolence or heedlessness occasions this profane deduction. Hence the preacher should be, as a logician, intensely honest. It is his sacred duty to practice the most painstaking care in constructing his arguments and to be sure that he sees all around his points before he ventures them. When you choose your text, then begin to examine them carefully. Some of them may wither in your hands and you say, the initial impression of this text was, oh boy, this will be... But upon close examination, you set it aside. Because you are determined by the grace of God that when you've opened up the scriptures that support the assertions you're making in your topical expository sermon, it is indeed a proclamation of the word of the living God. Well... We then move on to the intermediate steps or disciplines in the discussion or argument of a topical expository sermon. Number one, seek to reduce the mass of gathered material into its basic framework for preaching. It is here that giving precise shape or form to your subject is critical. In doing this, again, catechisms, confessions of faith, are most helpful. For example, when I've preached a series of sermons on repentance, justification, adoption, and other such weighty biblical themes, I have found the larger and shorter catechisms of the Westminster Standards to be of tremendous help in providing an organizing framework for the entire series of sermons. Because what we have in those beautiful catechetical definitions is the fruit of approximately 150 of the most able pastor theologians of that period wrestling with how do we state the essence of evangelical repentance with our eyes on our Bible, with our heads looking back to church history and the various heresies and errors that have plagued the church, to give as condensed and precise and comprehensive and accurate statement of a given biblical subject. Brethren, cash in on their labors. I'd have to take years to go around and interview 150 perceptive pastor theologians and say, hey, I want to preach a sermon, a series of sermons on repentance. Can you tell me what I ought to include? They'd say, yeah, read the catechism. Repentance unto life is a saving grace whereby a sinner out of a true sense of his sin and an apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ does with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. That's the biblical doctrine of repentance. Its roots are conviction of sin and a laying hold of the mercy of God in Christ. What is its substance? It involves a turning from sin unto God. And what is its fruit? With a full purpose of and an endeavor after new obedience. And then you've got the text to open them up and expound them and press them on the conscience. Same thing with justification. Justification is an act of God's free grace whereby he pardons all our sins, the negative aspect, accepts our persons as righteous in his sight. What are the grounds? For the righteous, only for the righteousness of Christ. How does it become ours, imputed to us? How do I take it? Received by faith alone. 
there's the biblical doctrine of justification. Then you take your key text out of Romans and Philippians and you expound them. You're not preaching the catechism. You're using it as a framework in order to preach the biblical doctrine arising out of a careful, responsible exposition of specific text of Scripture. Brethren, it thrills me every time I think of the benefit of using those materials. So, that next, that first intermediate step is seeking to take the fruit of your general acquisition of the field that you're going to preach on and then seek to begin to reduce that mass of material into the framework for preaching. And again, it is at this point you may choose to follow the Puritan model by taking one major text to set the foundation and framework and preach a series of sermons. But here, at this point, you've got to determine what are the main things you want to say. And I can remember again with that series on the fear of God, I first of all said, well, I want to persuade the people this is big time stuff in the Bible. So I took some specific text from every major section, starting in Genesis, all the way through to Revelation. And that was my first concern, the centrality of the fear of God in biblical religion. And then we dealt with the different kinds of the fear of God. When Adam sins and he's afraid and he hides, he ought to have been scared witless, and he ought to have hidden. But that's not the fear of God that is of the essence and soul of godliness. That's a different kind of fear. And you open up those distinctions. And so, brethren, this again is part of the labor that goes into responsible topical preaching. Second intermediate step is this. Compose your headings and select your key text to be expounded under each one of those headings. Select your headings. And then, I'm sorry, select your key text and then seek to range them under the headings by which you're going to divide up your argument or your discussion. Consider the following principles when you select your key text. Consider the suitability of the text for a relatively brief exposition. You should not select text which demand extensive explanations with respect to context intricate grammatical construction, or textually tenuous portions of Scripture. You don't want to be giving your people a lecture as to why this appears in some of their Bibles and not in some other people's Bibles. You don't want to do that. You want to carry the flow of your preaching, handling texts that are not trammeled with those extraneous issues that in consecutive exposition you come across a text like that, you have got to pause and say, people, tighten your seatbelt, put on your thinking cap. This is intricate grammar in this text, and we've got to have a little grammar lesson. But you want to avoid that, if at all possible, in choosing text in a topical expository sermon. As you're selecting your text, consider using the biblical theological framework. What texts show up on this theme starting in Genesis and all the way through Scripture? Take into account any known prejudices toward a given text and avoid the use of any text that will unnecessarily tweak those prejudices. And then, if at all possible, consider the texts that have been your companions for some time in which you may have had occasion to use frequently in the past. These texts are like proven horses. When you hop on them, you know how to handle them. And it's one of the joys of, of a lengthy ministry. Again, as well, you begin to find texts that you're very much at home with. You've done the thorough work of exposition. When you use them as proof text, you're confident you are giving a responsible handling of the Word of God, and then remember church history. How have God's people in the past understood these texts that I have chosen? This idea that the Son of Truth has been sitting in the West waiting for me to come on the scene, and alas, it arises on my fair head, and I see something that Matthew Henry never saw, uh, something that William Hendrickson never saw, something that John Calvin never saw. If they never saw it, probably ain't there to see. Probably ain't there to see. 
And so just go to another text. And then in this intermediate stage, carefully map out the manner in which you propose to expound these texts that you have chosen. Make sure they will bear the weight you're placing on them. And then at this point, use all the directives that I will give you with respect to a textual expository sermon as far as careful exegesis. And then the fourth intermediate step, if you're composing a series of sermons, mark out the divisions of your subject. For example, if you're going to bring a series on the subject of effectual calling, you first of all explain to your people you'll never find the words effectual calling in the Bible. I'm going to preach on a subject that the Bible never describes in these words. Uh Uh-oh, pastor's becoming a heretic. But then you say, ah, but just like the doctrine of the Trinity, Trinity's never found in the Bible, but there's an awful lot in the Bible that forces us to the use of the term The reason effectual calling is used is because the Bible speaks of a call that is genuine and does not effect a sinner actually coming to Christ. But there is a call that is always effective. And so we're going to consider that call under the title, The Bible's Teaching on Effectual Calling. How long did it take me to say that? What, a minute at the most? So then you're going to map out how you're going to handle it. Who is the author of calling? Who are the subjects of calling? What are the means of calling? What are the results of calling? And then the practical implications and applications of the doctrine of effectual calling. Map that out. Get that fixed in your mind. Then we come to the concluding steps. Number one, go back over the sermon and see if there are places where the judicious use of illustrations will help to clarify or impress the truth of your sermon more forcefully upon your hearers. Never put illustrations in for filler's sake. If they do not clarify the substance of the sermon, don't use them. If they do not intensify the pressure of the sermon, don't use them. But if you can come up with illustrations that clarify the substance and increase the pressure upon the affections and the will, then work in your illustration. Secondly, if it's appropriate to make applications along the way, this is the time to note those places in the actual argument or discussion part of the sermon and work in that application. Don't hold all of your application to your conclusion. Then thirdly, and brethren, I can't emphasize this enough, it is critical that you do not leave your transitions to be composed while you're actually preaching and do it on the fly. It's crucial that you have well thought out transitions from one major heading to another or from one major subdivision of your subject to another. It's crucial to remember your people have no written text in front of them. And unless you move their mental eye from point one to point two and from point two to point three, they can be lost. It's clear before you. It's there in your notes. It's the way you've arranged your notes, uh, your manuscript. But your people have no manuscript and you can leave them confused. Tell them, now that we have considered heading number one, which was, I've done it in these lectures. Even though you are men used to thinking at levels that the average layperson is not, I've reminded you, point number one was, now we move to point number two. Point one and two was, we move to point number three. One of the greatest weaknesses in my judgment in contemporary preaching is the absence of well-chiseled transitional statements and well-crafted recapitulations along the way in the argument of a sermon so that people are made to feel the cumulative weight of your argument or your discussion. Now then, some concluding guidelines. Concluding guidelines, number one, although you should ordinarily make a decided effort to see the whole series of sermons before you at the beginning, don't be so bound to your original scheme that you cannot and will not adapt as you plunged into the actual preaching 
of a topical expository series of sermons. Years ago, I was in the hospital with back surgery. And while there praying about my future ministry, I became convinced I need to bring a brief series, maybe 12, 15 sermons, on the pivotal doctrines of the Bible. So I started a series called Here We Stand. It ended up 108 sermons preaching systematic theology that God has used far beyond anything I could have imagined. As I got into it, the thing began to flower. The people began to take hold of it. And I said, Lord, I'm going to ride this horse as long as he's lathered up. <laughs> and just kept with him. And to encourage you along that line, how would you feel if you didn't have Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress? You have Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress because Bunyan recognized this principle when it came to writing. I want you to hear the old tinker of Bedford from his so-called apology at the beginning of Pilgrim's Progress. When at the first I took my pen in hand thus for to write, I did not understand that at all should make a little book in such a mood Nay, I had undertook to make another, which, when almost done, before I was aware, I this begun. In other words, the pilgrim's progress. And thus it was, I, writing of the way and race of saints in this our gospel day, fell suddenly into an allegory about their journey and the way to glory in more than twenty things which I set down. This done... I twenty more had in my crown, and they began to multiply like sparks that from the coals of fire do fly. Nay, then thought I, if that you breed so fast, I'll put you by yourselves, lest you at last should prove ad infinitum and eat out the book I already am about. Well, so I did. But yet I did not think to show to all the world my pen and ink in such a mode. I only thought to make I knew not what, nor did I undertake thereby to please my neighbor. No, not I. I did it my own self to gratify. Neither did I but vacant season spend in this my scribble, nor did I intend but to divert myself in doing this from worser thoughts which make me do amiss. Thus I set pen to paper with delight, and quickly had my thoughts in black and white, for having now my method by the end, still as I pulled it came, and so I penned it down, until it came at last to be for length and breadth the bigness which you see. I love that. I fall in love with Bunyan every time I read it. He was writing about something else, had a few thoughts, and the more he traced them out, this is the fruit. Who knows? Who knows what blessing God may have? You, you get your soul immersed in a series of topical sermons and the thing flowers and, and just seems to blossom out. Don't quench the spirit. So, should ordinarily map out ahead of time, but if it flowers, don't quench the spirit. Secondly, don't paralyze yourself by seeking to be exhaustive on your theme or subject. Tell your people, 15, 20 years from now, preaching on this subject, I hope I would handle it in a richer, fuller, more beautiful way, but convinced that this is the mind of God concerning this subject, taken from the word of God. Preach it with all your might. It's a wonderful thing to look back over years of ministry and not have to make any major retractions, though you've made many refinements and modifications. And that should be so as you are growing. Thirdly, don't overload your topical expository sermons with too much of a good thing. Under the old covenant, two or three witnesses could put you to death. Under the new, two or three witnesses can get you excommunicated. Don't feel you need to come with 10 texts on an issue. Choose your front rank soldiers. Expound them with sufficient thoroughness to carry the judgment of your people. Fourth word of concluding counsel, don't make any division without a distinction. 
when you make divisions, make sure that which you divided needs to be divided. Don't multiply divisions without a distinction. Make sure that the heading you've chosen does indeed address a specific issue that is not addressed in the next heading. And if you have something to bring that can all be set under one major heading and three, then do that. You don't need two, three, four points. Don't let yourself be trammeled with some preconceived notion that I've got to have this many headings or that many headings, but let the truth you're handling within the time frame you're handling it, let that determine how many headings you will have. Well, thankfully, I got through this lecture in this one hour. I was hoping I could, and uh, we have. Let's give God thanks. Our Father, we are thankful for hearing and answering our prayers that we might be able to cover this material in a responsible way. Thank you once more that you have been with us, and we pray now your blessing upon these moments where we relax our minds, and then as we gather again, come to us by your Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.